okay honestly i don't know why that was that on the crying face i did not do that and why are you over here go back go back to your place you're blocking the skull okay stay there now don't move bad model very bad model anyways hi <laughs> uh i actually wanted to do like a stream like this one for a while now but then i just never like got around to doing it because it was always like okay well, you know maybe i should play games instead because that's what people like and then i was like wait fuck that why do i care about what people like i like horror stories so i'm going to read some <laughs> and we're going to have fun with it <laughs> So yeah, I mean, honestly, when uh, uh, hold on, let me just adjust this mic. Okay, this should be fine. Yes. So initially, I was thinking of doing a stream today. I was like, okay, maybe I'll just play Insanity. But then I remembered those characters, those choices, that dialogue. <laughs> I was like, fuck that. I don't want to. <laughs> I'm not putting myself through that. That's torture. And like my mind just kind of just drifted into like stories, and it kind of just d- drifted into horror stories and urban legends. So I was like, you know what? We're doing a horror story stream. We're gonna read out some co- cool shit, spook ourselves, and then go to bed. <laughs> so yeah, horror stream. Ah. Uh, I don't think there's any better way to like really get back into streaming than to do something that you like. So yeah, for today we not only have a whole new layout, which is just a skull in the middle, <laughs> but we also have, oh uh, yeah, we also have creepy pastas, and we have urban legends. I want to get some stories from Reddit, but for that you need to like have prior permission from the authors. And since this was so short notice, I couldn't do that. But God, I checked out the creepy pasta site, and I have to say, she's gone downhill. Like I remember when creepy pastas were a thing, back when I was like, okay, creepy pastas have always been a thing. But like, back when I was. like i think uh how old was i maybe like 13 is when i discovered creepy pastas and i know like they have that thing that oh you know you have to be like uh 18 plus to be on this side but i mean it's the internet who's honest about that age <laughs> i am 18 plus now but still yeah so when i first got like Yeah, when I first saw on the site, it looked so creepy, but now it looks so outdated. Like, and so down. It's just all gone downhill. It's not aesthetic. There's no creepy atmosphere. It's just a black screen with red text, and also text that doesn't align properly. It's sad. It's like they let let themselves go as time went on. Ah. <sighs> But yeah, I still managed to pick out some nice creepy pastas, including some really classic ones. I don't know, damn creepy pasta, how far you fallen? It's sad. It's honestly really sad. But what can you do? <laughs> yeah, but so I picked up some like really nice classic creepy pastas. I tried tried going through like the new ones, but they were so dreary and so so slow. Like I could not. I was like, nah, no, nah, not doing this. So yeah, we got some nice classic creepy pastas, and we got some urban legends, you know, Japanese ones because those are like really freaky. A little bit of Bloody Mary and stuff like that as well. So we're gonna have some fun, and you know what? Let's let's get into it. Let us start. Hold on. Ah, there we go. <laughs> yes, it is the same screen, but it has different music. Creepy music. Oh, hold on. That's too loud. Uh, that should be fine, I think. Yes, creepy music. Now, where were we? Let's see. Uh, aha, there we go. So we're gonna start off our amazing quest with 
this Japanese urban legend known as the Teke Teke. Is it Tiki Tiki or Teke Teke? I'm not very sure. I'm gonna go with Teke Teke. <clears throat> so, what is the Teke Teke? Our story begins at night when a boy named Satoshi is on his way back home. He had just left his cram school and was walking through some empty streets at it, as it was nearing 10 pm. As he passed through a neighborhood, he saw a beautiful young girl near the top of an abandoned building. She was leaning out the window with her elbows propped on the window sill. She looked down at him, contempt and jealousy hiding behind her eyes. Suddenly, the girl jumped out of the window. Shocked, Satoshi could do nothing but watch her fall. When the girl landed, Satoshi realized something horrible. The girl only had half a body. Her torso had been split in half and her legs were nowhere to be found. Unbeknownst to him, the vengeful spirit belonged to a girl who had accidentally fallen onto some train tracks seconds before a train passed by, cutting her in half. The girl started dragging herself forward, a skeet in one hand, as she skittered towards him on her elbows and claw-like hands. A teke teke sound echoed around him. Before he could move, she pushed off her elbows, swinging her skeet in his midsection. So though she felt the skeet tear through him, and soon, nothing. As he lay on the ground, blackness closing in around him, he saw her hate-filled face hovering above him, a look of triumph frosted. That would be the last thing he would ever see. Eww. Oh my god. Okay. That's interesting. I wonder. So I'm still wondering, what did that poor boy do to you? <laughs> Why are you killing him? <laughs> it's like Satoshi, you exist. You go to cram school, you die. <laughs> but here's the thing, Take Take Lady. He's going to cram school, he's already dying. <laughs> poor man has to go to school in the morning. And then to sc- cram school in the evening. What life does he have? I think you, with your skeet, have a better life than he does. <laughs> but I guess we're just killing people. <laughs> oh. There is an alternate version to this story, by the way. <clears throat> Wait, where is this story? She was ending his suffering. She was like, <laughs> you know what? You're right. She was ending his suffering. <laughs> oh my god. She was like, listen, I see what you're going through. Let me help you. <laughs> oh. oh. So, in the end, she's not a ghost. She's like an avenging angel. She's like, I'm here to set you free. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next up, we have another room. We have the story. Wait, hold on. Where to go? Yep, there we go. Next up, we have the story. It's an it's another Japanese urban legend. This is the story of the slit mouthed woman. Damn, that is that is a name. <laughs> <coughs> Toshiro and his best friend. Taro and Kenichi were walking home one evening after a late baseball practice session. As they were walking home, joking and pushing each other, they saw a tall woman appear in front of them as if it was out of nowhere. She had a long brown coat, long jet black hair, and a pale face. Most of her face was covered by a white surgical mask. While she didn't seem so intimidating, she had an aura of danger about her that scared the boys. Why are you scared? She's wearing a surgical mask. She's following COVID guidelines. Like, dude, can you imagine ghosts are better at following COVID guidelines than humans are? Pathetic. They turned around to walk the other direction, but there she was again. She walked towards them. The boys could not move for terror. First, she looked at Kenichi and asked, Am I pretty? Kenichi confusedly stammered, No. She suddenly pulled out a pair of big, rusty scissors and plunged them into Kenichi's chest. Toshiro and Taro tried to run again, but no matter where they turned, she would appear in front of them. Next, she asked Taro, Am I pretty? 
Taro replied, Yes, yes, very pretty. The woman reached up and pulled off her mask. Each side of her mouth had been sliced open to her ears. How about now? she asked. No, Taro said. The woman took her scissors and cut Taro in half. Finally, she looked at Toshiro and asked him the same question. Toshiro answered yes both times. The woman smiled and lifted the bloody scissors. She grabbed his face, forcing his mouth open. She cut his face to be like hers and said, Now you look like me. That's not fair. He, he gave you what you wanted. <laughs> Wait, there's a there's a ways to escape. Okay, <laughs> let's see. Since the story's inception, a few ways of surviving the slit-mouthed woman have emerged. One is to answer ambiguously. This will confuse her, and you can escape. Another way is to throw some candy, which she will pick up, leaving her. <laughs> to throw some candy. <laughs> oh god, I'm just imagining like someone just like you know an exorcist wants to catch this ghost and he's just like leaving behind like a trail of candy <laughs> and she's just following it <laughs> and then he just throws a bag on top of her and kidnaps her and it's like ah oh, exorcism finished <laughs> Okay anyways You know what I get to distract you get distracted <laughs> You know what agreed <laughs> Agreed. It's candy. <laughs> okay, that's one way. And the final way is you can parrot her question back at her. Am I pretty? And this will also confuse her. You know, for a ghost or hellbent on killing people, she's not very, you know, smart. <laughs> but I wonder what an ambiguous way to answer the question is. Am I pretty? What do you answer? Like, do you say maybe? <laughs> Would that be ambiguous enough? <laughs> or do you just, you know, shout out, a, shout out a meme at her and just make her run for it while she tries to figure out what the fuck? She's like, am I pretty? And you're like, I'm Jared19 and I will fucking learn how to read and you run for it. <laughs> because, you know, the whole idea is to confuse her, right? And that will confuse her because she'll be like, who the hell is Jared19 and what does reading have to do with my question? <laughs> So, you know, guys, keep keep this in mind. <laughs> I'm Jared 19 and I will fucking learn how to read. <laughs> I can't tell you if you're pretty or not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see. Next one. Hmm. Ah, Slenderman. I want to read this. Come on, everyone loves Slender Man. Who doesn't love Slender Man? This man's gave me so many nightmares when I was a kid. But now, now that I've been exposed to the internet and hentai, <laughs> oh god, and now it just doesn't do anything. <laughs> okay. Mm. I think there's a story. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Slender Man. If only you hadn't looked back. Though it was the it was autumn the day had seemed long and brief. Walk towards home short. What the hell is this language? As the sunlight began to fade, you and your two friends left the playground behind and trudged reluctantly home, knowing that you would be forced to pick up the games and conversations the next day. The next day never came. If only you hadn't looked back, but you had. Turning just for a moment, you had glanced back towards the tree line, seen the fingers of their branches glowing up towards the sky, and besides them, the figure. At first you thought you must be mistaken, that your eyes in the hazy blur of twilight were playing tricks on you, but no. When you looked again, he was still there, taller than any man could be thinner than any willowy branches that extended ever upward from the trees. He loomed in the distance, like the shadow of some horrible dark truth, and he knew instantly that he had to look away. But if it didn't tear your eyes away from the blank, featureless face, then soon the blank would wash over you, become you, and you would walk slowly but surely, as if pulled by some magnetic force towards him. 
toward him though you feared him though you were scared of his unnatural height the aching blank whiteness of his face the arms that seemed to stretch towards you and slithering tentacles behind <laughs> not the tentacles why must it be the tentacles <laughs> you turned screwing up your eyes telling willing yourself not to look not to see not to give in and go to him but you screamed to the others telling them the same telling them not to look but as you open your eyes you realize they had already looked they were already gone okay now that's just a definition of the creepy pasta that's not what we need but yeah that's creepy that's creepy <laughs> what's this slender man appearances what happened to you creepy pasta ah there's a story <clears throat> after waking up with a jolt the girl laid in a bed a few seconds longer reaching over to the switch on her bedside lamp she tried to remember exactly what had stolen her sweet slumber away when she couldn't the brunette swung her legs over the side of the bed and heaved herself up checking the time on her phone she snorted when she saw it was midnight the witching hour knowing that sleep would only evade her she left her bed for the kitchen a good cup of coffee on her mind as she passed by her front door a chill spread like liquid fire down her spine it's only winter she told herself focusing on the coffee and the coffee plan measuring out scoops water and preparing her cup kept her occupied but as the dark liquid boiled she had nothing left to keep her mind from the one from wandering off the chill returned and she couldn't help but glance behind her to the front door it stood there innocently enough just like always the dead wood was still in place and she could see nothing amiss with it turning back to her coffee she did her best to forget about the feeling with the cup in her hand she started back towards her bedroom as she walked by the front door she decided that a quick glance out of the peephole would help calm her restless mind the chill worsened with each step she took towards the door and further away from the safety and warmth of her blankets she pressed her empty hand against the cold metal door and took a deep breath before leading her eye to the peep hole at first she could only see an inky blackness and somehow seemed to swirl in itself when she blinked in surprise the void melted away she wished it hadn't in its place there stood what she could only guess was once a man The limbs were long and inhumanly awkward with bulky joints branching off into several arms not unlike the trees branches of trees The creature was draped in a black suit somehow making the thing more nightmarish to her The icing on the pro- proverbial cake however was what passed as the hellish thing's face It was as though her mind blurred the ghastly visage to spare her further shock and horror She shoved herself away from the liquid with the with the hand still pressed against it. The scalding mug of the coffee fell, the liquid burning her bare legs as she fell backwards and tried to call, crawl away from the door. She knew somehow that her mind hadn't been playing tricks on her. As she crawled away from the door, she watched as tendrils as black as the void she first saw snake around through the cracks. The girl was trapped between the instinct to flee and the gut feeling to not turn her back on the door when the door jolted the urge to flee overcame her and she slipped in the burning liquid as she tried to make it back to her room she knew deep down that she was trapping herself in a corner but she had to get away from the door the girl was halfway down the hallway when she heard the previously locked door creak open she screamed and slipped into a wall cracking her chin on it and stunning her after that there was only blackness Nicole a warm pale male voice snapped the woman out of her trance as she turned around she was met by one of her sister's doctors she nodded not too sure if she should say an- say anything or if she could even find her voice if she did have something to say that morning she had gotten an urgent phone call from the hospital saying that her sister Lindsay was there before they had even let her see her the doctors had pulled her off the side and insisted that they had to talk about what might have happened phrases like self-inflicted and assault had been thrown around and nicole felt her mind reel she still hadn't fully understood what they had been saying until she saw lindsay with her own eyes her sister had a bandage wrapped around her head 
covering both of her ears as well as her eyes. They said it was to keep her now deadened eyes from drying out and to keep her and to try and keep her infection out of the wounds Lindsay had made to her ears. The doctors had guessed that either she or someone else had jammed a pencil into them to keep her off balance or to deafen her against something. There was a mix of first and second degree burns on her hands, legs and feet from what was assumed to be coffee her neighbors found slipped all over the entry of her apartment. As Nicole walked into her sister's hospital for the first time, she thought she had spied the silhouette of a man in the window that she knew was impossible. Her sister's room was on the third floor of the hospital. <laughs> Hi Poppy, welcome to the stream. We're just reading some horror stories here, creepy pastas and such. And my god, what the hell are these pictures? I don't want to see them. <laughs> I don't know what's so freaky about the slender man. Because he's just a guy in a suit. He's just a guy in a suit. But when I was a kid and I saw this for the first time, like, you know, so creepy pasta has pictures, right? Like most of the people, they edit these pictures and upload them. So I used to like, you know, you know, you have those arrow keys. I used to just like click, click on them because I don't want to, I wanted to see the picture, but I didn't want to see the whole thing. The whole thing freaked me out. And I don't know why. <laughs> Ah, uh, creepy pasta. But yeah, that was an interesting story, though it was a bit confusing. Because like from what I remember about the Slender Man, he only like ever went after kids. If Lindsay is a kid, where the fuck are her parents? What kind of parents would just leave their child alone to wander around at night and make coffee? What kind of kids drink coffee? Okay, water has been consumed. Ah, Slender Man. I think the one thing that ruined Slender Man for me. Have you guys seen that movie? Like the new Slender Man movie? The one that recent. It, I think it came out in 2019. It was so bad. <laughs> it was so bad. <laughs> But yeah, that kind of just ruined Slender Man for me for good. I was like, mm, can't take you seriously, my guy. <laughs> okay, we're gonna move on to the next story. Mm. Mm, let me see, what are we gonna read? Uh... Oh, can you please take away the Reddit stories? I cannot read those. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> My uh, the site where I was picking up the stories from just shifted into a user report about Genshin Impact. <laughs> I don't think I've seen that one, but man, I avoid. Yeah, it's a really, it's a horrible movie. It's not even scary. It's more like, it's like you know when you find Snapchat for the first time, and you try out these all these weird fl filters that just blur out your face and all that kind of stuff. It's just that with a lot of weird slow motion in it. It's not interesting at all. Okay. okay, found it. So apparently there's this um creepy pasta. I never read this before and I didn't know it existed until today known as the smile dog basically someone's taken a picture of a husky and uh, photoshopped a human smile onto its face it looks it looks ugh, like i don't want to look at it <laughs> but yeah that's the whole point right <clears throat> let's see you tell yourself over and over it's just an image just a stupid picture of a stupid dog that someone has photoshopped teeth onto it isn't very scary or at least it doesn't scare you. Not one bit. How could it scare you? It's just a picture. You tell yourself these things, but when you do, you lie. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> so <laughs> I swear to God, <laughs> it is creepy, okay? <laughs> I'm not a crazy person. The image does scare you. Something about that smile too wide with too many teeth. The same, all to better eat you with, smile that big bad wolf gave to the Red Riding Hood. A smile full of threat and sharpness. How do you know that? Were you there? 
again you try to bury the idea to ignore it but it's no use even when you close your eyes you see it smiling maniacally back at you the eyes illuminated and searing burning into your mind your soul you no know, right then you have to get rid of it to pass the message into someone else to do as things say and spread the word you know that you'll do these things because you must because if you don't you know that eventually he will pay you a visit oh oh no <laughs> it's a horror story <laughs> oh no it's a horror story about chain mails <laughs> i don't think i don't think i have seen a chain mail since oh god it's been years you know those emails that come to you and it's like you know if you don't forward this to 3 to 30 people in the next 24 hours you'll die <laughs> guess what internet i'm still alive <laughs> okay let's see what the story is i first met in person with mary e in the summers of 2007 i had arranged with her husband of 15 years terence to see her for an interview mary had initially agreed since i was not a newsman but rather an amateur writer gathering information for a few early college assignments and if all went according to plan some pieces of fiction We scheduled the interview for a particular weekend when I was in Chicago on an unrelated business. But at the last moment Mary changed her mind and locked herself in the couple's bedroom, refusing to meet with me. For half an hour, I sat with Terence as we camped outside the bedroom door. I listened and took notes while he attempted to fruitlessly calm his wife. The things that Mary said made little sense, but for the pattern I was expecting. Though I could not see her, I could tell from her voice that she was crying. and more often than not her objections to speaking with me centered around an incoherent diatribe on her dreams her nightmares then she apologized profusely when we ceased the exercise and i did my best to take it in stride recall that i wasn't a reporter in search of a story but merely a curious young man in search of information besides i thought at the time i could perhaps find another similar case if i put my mind and resources to it Okay. But what kind of stories are you looking for? Who is Mary E? Why am I asking these questions that probably answered as I read? <laughs> Mary E was the sysip for a small Chicago-based bulletin board system in 1992 when she first encountered the smile.jpg and her life changed forever. She and Terence had been married only for 5 months. Mary was one of an estimated 400 people who saw the image when it was posted as a hyperlink on the BBS though she is the only one who has spoken op- openly about the experience the rest have remained anonymous or are perhaps dead ooh in 2005 when i was only in 10th grade smile.jpg was first brought to my attention by my burgeoning interest in web based phenomena mary the most often cited victim of what is most sometimes referred to as smile.dog The smile.jpg is repeated to display. What caught my interest, other than the obvious macabre elements of the cyber legend and my proclivity towards such things, was the sheer lack of information. Usually to the point that people don't believe it even exists other than as a, as a rumor or a hoax. It is, a un- it is unique, though the entire phenomena centers on a picture file. That file is nowhere to be found on the internet. Certainly, many photo manipulated s- simulacra litter the web showing up with the most frequency on sites such as image board 4chan of course of course that's 4chan particularly the x focus paranormal subboard it is suspected that these are fake because they do not have the same effect the true smile or jpeg is believed to have namely sudden onset temporal lobe epilepsy and acute anxiety The purported reaction in the viewer is one of the reasons the phantom like smile or jpeg is discard- regarded with such disdain since it is patently absurd that depending on whom you ask the reluctance to acknowledge smile or jpeg's existence might be just as much out of fear as it is out of the disbelief neither smile or jpeg nor smile dot dog is mentioned anywhere on wikipedia So the website features articles on other such perhaps more scandalous shock sites as hello.jpg or two girls one 
<laughs> no, not two girls, one cup. <laughs> no. See, I was getting into this story, but now you brought up two girls, one cup, and now I'm just laughing. <laughs> Any attempt to create a page pertaining to smile.jpg is summarily deleted by any of the encyclopedia's many admins. Encounters with smile.jpg are the stuff of internet legend. Mary E's story is not unique. There are unverified rumors of smile.jpg showing up in the early days of Usenet, and even one persistent tale that in 2002 a hacker flooded the forums of humor and satire website, something awful with the deluge of smile.jpg. Dot dog pictures rendering almost half the firm's users at the time epile- epileptic. Oh, okay. It is also said that in the mid to late 90s that smile.jpg circulated on Usenet as an attachment of a chain mail with the subject line Smile, God loves you. Yet, despite the huge exposure these stunts would generate, there are few people who admit to having experienced any of them, and no trace of the file or any link has ever been discovered. Okay, listen, honestly speaking, if I ever got an email which says, smile, God is, God loves you, that would be going in my spam folder, I would not even open it. <laughs> just, that's just the way, just the way of the world. <sighs> Anyways, moving on. Those who have claimed to see Smile.jpg often weakly joke that they were far too busy to save a copy of the picture to their hard drive. <laughs> I had to see if it was a <laughs> However, all alleged victims of the same description of the dog, a dog-like creature usually described as appearing similar to a Siberian husky, illuminated by the flash of the camera, sits in a dim room, the only background detail that is visible being a human hand extending from the darkness to the left side of the frame. The hand is empty, but is usually described as beckoning. Of course, more attention is given to the dog or dog creature as some victims are more certain than others about what they claim to have seen. The muzzle of the beat is beast is reputedly split in a wide grin, revealing two rows of very white, very st- straight, very sharp, very human-looking teeth. This, of course, is not a description given immediately after viewing the picture, but rather a recollection of the victims who claim to have seen the picture endlessly repeated in their mind's eye during the time they are, in reality, having epileptic fits. These fits are reported to continue indeterminately, often while the victims sleep, resulting in very vivid and disturbing images. These may be treated with medication, though in some cases it is more effective than others. Mary E. I assumed was not an effective was not on effective medication. That was why, after my visit to her apartment in 2007, I sent out feelers to several folklore and urban legend-oriented news groups, website, and mailing lists, hoping to find the name of the supposed victim of Smile or JPEG who felt more interested in talking about his experiences. For a time, nothing happened, and at length, I forgot about I forgot about my pursuits, since I had begun my freshman college uh, year of college, and was quite busy. Mary contacted me via email, however, near the beginning of March 2008. Subject, last summer's interview. Dear Mr. L. L? Like, death note L? Ain't you dead, my guy? Okay. I'm incredibly sorry about my behavior last summer when you came to interview me. I hope you understand that it is no fault of yours, but rather my own problem problems that led me to act out as I did. I realized that I could have handled the situation more decorously. However, I hope you will forgive me. At the time, I was afraid. You see, for 15 years, I have been haunted by Smile.jpg. Smile.dog comes to me in my sleep every night. I know that sounds silly, but it is true. There is an ineffable quality about my dreams my nightmares that makes them completely unlike any real dreams that I've ever had. I do not move and do not speak. I simply look ahead and the only thing ahead of me is the scene from that horrible picture. I see the beckoning hand and I see smile or dog. It talks to me. It is not a dog, of course, though I'm not quite sure what it really is. It tells me that it will leave me alone if I only do as it asks. All I must do, it says, is spread the word. 
That is how it phrases its demands. And I know exactly what it means. It wants me to show it to someone else. And I could. The week after my incident, I received received in the mail a manila envelope with no return address. Inside was only a three and a half inch floppy diskette. Without having to check, I knew precisely what was on it. I thought for a long time about my options. I could show it to a stranger, a co co-worker. I could even show it to Terence, as much as the idea disgusted me. But what would happen then? Well, if Smile.Dog kept its word, I could sleep. Yet, if it lied, what would I do? And who was to say something worse would not come for me if I did as the creature asked? So, I did nothing for 15 years, though I kept the diskette hidden among my other things. Every night for 15 years, Smile.Dog has come to me in my sleep and demanded that I spread the word. For 15 years, I have stood strong, though there have been hard times. Many of my fellow victims on the BBS board, where I first encountered Smile.JPEG, stopped posting. I heard some of them committed suicide. Others remained completely silent, simply disappearing off the face of the web. They are the ones I worry about the most. I sincerely hope you will forgive me, Mr. L, but last summer when you contacted me and my husband about an interview, I was near the breaking point. I decided I was going to give you the floppy diskette. I did not care if Smile.Dog was lying or not. I wanted it to end. You were a stranger, someone I had no connection with, and I thought that I would not feel sorrow when you took the diskette as part of your research and sealed your fate. Before you realize, before you arrived, I realized what I was doing. I was plotting to ruin your life. I could not stand the thought, and in fact, I still cannot. I am ashamed, Mr. L, and I hope that this, will, this warning will dissuade you from further inf- investigating Smile.jpg. You may in time encounter someone who is, if not weaker than I, then wholly more depraved, someone who will not hesitate to follow Smile.Dog's orders. Stop while you are still whole. Sincerely, Mary E. Terence contacted me later that month with the news that his wife had killed herself. While cleaning up the various things she had left behind, closing email accounts and the like, he happened upon the above message. He was a man in shambles. He wept as he told me to listen to his wife's advice. He found the diskette, he revealed, and burned it until it was nothing but a stinking pile of blackened plastic. The part that most disturbed him, however, was how the diskette had hissed as it melted, like some sort of animal, he said. I will admit that I was uncertain about how to respond to this. At first, I thought it was a joke, with the couple belatedly playing with the situation in order to get a rise out of me. A quick check of several Chicago newspaper online obituaries, however, proved that Mary E. was indeed dead. There was, of course, no mention of suicide in the article. I decided that for a time, for a time at least, I would not further pursue the subject of Smile or JPEG, especially since I had finals coming up at the end of May. But the world has an odd way of testing us. Almost a year after I returned from a disaster interview with Mary E, I received another email. Oh my god. Okay. Hello. I found your email address through a mailing list on your profile which said that you are interested in Smile Dog. I saw it's not as bad as everyone, I have to say, it's not as bad as everyone says. So I sent it to you here, just spreading the word. Smiley face. Oh no. It's not the message that's creepy, it's the smiley face. I hate smiley faces. <laughs> the final line chilled me to the bone. According to my email client, there was one file attachment called naturally smile.jpg. I considered downloading it for some time. It was mostly, most likely a fake. And even if it wasn't there, I never wholly convinced. was never wholly convinced of Smile.jpg's peculiar powers. Mary's e, Mary E's account had shaken me, yes, but she was probably mentally unbalanced anyway. After all, how could a simple image do what Smile.jpg was set to accomplish? What sort of creature was it that it could break one's mind with only the power of the eye? And if such things were patently absurd, then why did the legend exist at all? I downloaded the image. If I looked at it, and if Mary turned out to be correct, if Smile.dog came to me in my dreams demanding I spread the word, what would I do? Would I live my life as Mary had, fighting against the urge to give in until I died? Or would I simply spread the word, eager to be put to rest? And if I chose the latter route, how could I do it? Whom would I burden in turn? If I went through 
with my earlier intention to write a short article about smile.jpg i decided i could add i could attach it as evidence and anyone who read the article anyone who took interest would be affected and even assuming the smile.jpg attached to the image was genuine would i be capacious enough to save myself in that matter could i spread the word yes yes i could and obviously there's a picture of smile.jpg like smile dog at the end which i'm not going to scroll down to fuck you <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> so yes, that was smile. Don't cheat, Peg. <laughs> How do you take like an adorable dog and turn it into something creepy? I like the cr- innovativeness, though. It's like you know you're taking a chainmail and going like, ah, oh, so you're threatening my life. Fine. <laughs> Fine, threaten it. Let's go. Let's do this. <laughs> okay. Here comes the child bride and back to town. I mean, hmm. I don't know, man. It's an okay story though. I think it dwells so much on like explanations of what Smile Dog is that it focuses less on creating that creepy factor. It could be better, I think. It's okay. The dog's creepy though. Oh god, how could you take a cute little puppy and turn it creepy? <sighs> I'll never understand people. It's a puppy. It should be adorable. Why you do this? Why you make it human? <sighs> okay, now we're gonna read. This one, I have to say, is my favorite creepy pasta. I haven't tried it, read it in years. I read it when I was like fourteen, and when I did, yeah, it doesn't have that horror feel, right? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so anyways, this quick creepy pasta is something I loved when I was a kid. Um, I mean, not just loved it, freaked the fuck out of me. And there was like, I think someone took the story and made like an animation for it, which was even creepier. But we're not gonna show the animation because it's like very, very, very graphic. So I'm not sure if you guys know about this one. Uh, this story is known as Squidward's Suicide. It is. I don't know. There was some, something just so inherently creepy about it. So yeah. Let me just drink some water though. Ugh, that just last story was long. <sighs> okay. Now we shall read. Squidward's suicide. <clears throat> I just want to start off by saying, if you want an answer at the end, prepare to be disappointed. There just isn't one. I was in intern at Nickelodeon Studios for a year in 2005 for my degree in animation. It wasn't paid. Of, it wasn't paid, of course. Most in- internships aren't, but it did have some perks beyond education. See, the real horror of the story is an unpaid internship. <laughs> Bro, if you're gonna bring in interns, pay them at least. Like, give them something. You're gonna, if you're gonna work them to the bone, you gotta give them something. Apart from you know exposure and experience. Anywho, to adults, it might not seem like a big one, but some kids at the time would go crazy over it. Now, since I work direct, that'll be me soon. <laughs> oh no, Sue. <soon. laughs> Sue, no, don't do an unpaid internship. Don't become a horror story. <laughs> Now, since I worked directly with the editors and animators, I got to view the new episodes days before they aired. I'll get right to it without giving too many unnecessary details. They had recently made the SpongeBob movie, and the entire s- staff was somewhat sapped of creativity, so it took them longer to start up the season. The delay lasted longer for more upsetting reasons. There was a problem with the series for premiere that set everyone and everything back for se- several months. Me and two other interns were in the editing room along with the lead animators and sound editors for the final cut. We received a copy that was supposed to be "Fear of a Crabby Patty" and gathered around to sc- around to watch it. 
Now, given that it isn't final yet, animators often put a mock title card, sort of a jo- inside joke for us with phony, often sometimes lewd titles such as How Sex Doesn't Work instead of Rockabye Bewave? Biv- Biv- okay. When SpongeBob and Patrick adopt a sea scallop. Nothing particularly funny, but work related chuckles. So when we saw the title card Squidward's Suicide, we didn't think it was more than a morbid joke. One of the inters did a small throat laugh at it. The happy go lucky music plays as is normal. The story began with Squidward practicing his clarinet, hitting a few star notes like normal. We hear SpongeBob laughing outside, and Squidward stops, yelling at him to keep it down as he has a concert that night and he needs to practice. SpongeBob says okay and goes to see Sandy with Patrick. The bubble splash the bubble splash screen comes up and we see the ending of Squidward's concert. This is when things seem off. While playing, a few frames repeat themselves, but the sound doesn't. At this point the sound is synced up with the animation so you, yes that's not uncommon. But when he stops playing, the sound finishes as if the skipping never happened. There is a slight murmuring in the crowd before they begin to boo him. Not normal cartoon booing that is common in the show, but you could cl- clearly hear the malice in it. Squidward's in full frame and looks visibly afraid. The shot goes to the crowd with SpongeBob in the center frame, and he too is booing, very much unlike him. That isn't the oddest thing, though. What is odd is everyone had hyper-realistic eyes, very detailed. Clearly not shots of people's shots of real people's eyes, but something a bit more real than CGI. The pupils were red, some of us looked at each other obviously confu- confused, and since we weren't the writers, we didn't question it. It's appeals it's appeal to children yet. The shot goes to Squidward sitting on the edge of his bed, looking very forlorn. The view out of his porthole window is of the night sky, so it isn't very long after the concert. The unsettling part is that at this point there is no sound. Literally no sound. Nor even the feedback from the speakers in the room. It's as if the speakers were turned off, though the status showed that they were working perfectly. He just sat there, blinking, in the silence for about 30 seconds. Then he started to sob softly. He put his hands over his eyes and cried quietly for a full minute more, all the while a sound in the background very slowly growing from nothing to barely audible. It sounded like a light breeze from a forest. The screen slowly began to zoom in on, on his face. But slow I mean by slow I mean it's only noticeable if you take if you look at the shots ten seconds apart from side by side. His sobbing gets louder, more full of hurt and anger. The screen then twitches a bit, as if it twists twists in on itself for a split second, then goes back to normal. The wind through the tree sound gets slowly louder and more severe, as if a storm is brewing somewhere. The eerie part is that the sound and Squidward sobbing sounded real, as if the sound wasn't coming from the speakers, but it's as if the speakers were holes, the sound was coming through from the other side. At go- as good as the sound as th- I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> as good as sound as the studio likes to have, they don't purchase the equipment to be that good to produce sound of that quality. Below the sound of the wind and sobbing, very faint, something sounded like laughing. It came at odd intervals and never lasted more than a second, so you had a hard time pinning it. We watched the show twice, so pardon me if things sound too specific, but I've had time to think about them. After 30 seconds of this, the screen blurred and twitched violently and something flashed over it, as if a single frame was replaced. The lead animator, animation editor paused and rewound frame by frame. What, what we saw was horrible. It was the photo of a child. He couldn't have been more than six. His face was mangled and bloodied, one eye dangling over his upturned face, popped. He was naked down his underwear, underwear, his stomach cut crudely, and his entrails lying beside him. He was laying on some pavement that was probably a road. The most upsetting part was that there was a shadow of the photographer. There was no crime tape, no evidence tag or markers, and the angle was completely off for a short design to be evidence. It would seem the photographer was the person responsible for the child's death. We were of course mortified, but pressed on, hoping that this was a sick joke. The scene flipped back to Squidward still sobbing, louder than before and half-body in frame. 
there was now what appeared to be a blood running down his face from his eyes. The blood was also done in hyper-realistic style, looking as if you touched it, you'd get blood on your fingers. The wind sounded now as if it were that of a gale blowing through the forest. There were even snapping sounds of branches. The laughing, a deep baritone, lasting at longer intervals and coming more frequently. After about 20 seconds, the screen again twisted and showed a single frame photo. The editor was reluctant to go back. We all were, but he knew he had to. This time the photo was that of a little girl, no older than the first child. She was laying on her stomach, her barrets in a pool of blood next to her. Her left eye too was popped and popped naked except for underpants. Her entrails were piled on top of her above another crude cut along her back. Again, the body was on the street and the photographer's shadow was visible, very similar in size and shape to the first. I had to choke back vomit and one intern, the only female in the room, ran out. The show resumed. About five seconds after the second photo played, Squidward went silent, as did all sound, like it was like it was when the scene started. He put his tentacles down and his eyes were now done in hyperrealism like the others were in the beginning of the episode. They were bleeding, bloodshot and pulsating. He just stared at the screen as if watching the viewer. After about 10 seconds, he started sobbing, this time not covering his eyes. The sound was piercing and loud and most fear-inducing of all is his sobbing was mixed with screams. Tears and blood were dripping down his face at a heavy rate. The wind sound came back and so did the deep voiced laugh and this time the still photo lasted for a good 5 frames. The animator was able to stop it on the fourth and backed up. This time the photo was of a boy about the same age. The scene was different. The entrails were being pulled out from the stomach wound by a large hand. The right eye popped and had dangling, blood trickling down it. The animator proceeded. It was hard to believe. The next one was different and we couldn't tell what. He went on to the next, same thing. He went back to the first, played them quicker, and I lost it. I vomited, vomited on the floor, the animating and sound editors gasping at the scene. The five frames were not as if there were five different photos. They were played out as if they were frames from a video. We saw the hands slowly lift out the guts. We saw the kid's eyes focus on it. We even saw the two frames of the kid's kid beginning to blink. The lead sound editor told us to stop. He had to call the creator to see this. Mr. Hillenberg arrived within f- about 15 minutes. He was confused as to why he was called down there, so the editor just continued the episode. Once the few frames were shown, all screaming, all sound again stopped. Squidward was just staring at the sc- view- viewer, full frame of the face, for about 3 seconds. The shot quickly pl- panned out and the deep voice said, Do it! And we see Squidward's hand. We see in Squidward's hand a shotgun. He immediately puts the gun in his mouth and pulls the trigger. Realistic blood and brain matter splatters on the wall behind him and his bed and he flies back with the force. The last five seconds of the episode show his body on the bed on on his side, one eye dangling on what's left of his head above the floor, staring blankly at it. Then the episode ends. Mr. Hillenberg is obviously angry at this. He demanded to know what the heck was going on. Most people left the room at this point, so it was just a handful of us to watch it again. Viewing the episode twice only served to imprint the entirety of it in my mind and caused me horrible nightmares. I'm sorry I stayed. The only theory we could think of was that the file was edited by someone in the chain from the drawing studio to here. So the CDO was called in to analyze when it happened. The analysis of the file would show it was edited over by new material. However, the timestamp of it was mere 24 seconds before we began to view it. All the equipment involved was examined for foreign software and hardware as well as, well as glitches. As if the timestamp may have glitched and showed the wrong time. But everything checked out fine. We don't know what happened and to this day nobody does. There was an investigation due to the, due the nature of the photos. But nothing came of it. No child scene was identified and no clues were gathered from the data and were no physical clues in the photos. I never believed in an unexplainable phenomenon before. But now, I have something happen and can't prove anything about it beyond ac- anecdotal evidence. I think twice about things. Oh <sighs> my god. This one still creeps me out, I'm not gonna lie. This story still creeps me out. Like Slenderman, Smile Dog, whatever. This one freaks me out. <laughs>
I think the thing that keeps it's not just the level of detail in it but it's like you know the way the atmosphere has been set you, was from the beginning till the end you know something is sort of very very wrong even when the episode is going normally with Squidward you know practicing and stuff you that feeling is there that something is wrong and when you start imagining everything in your head it's like oh my god why did i do that why did i do that to myself Hmm. And it's also you take something like SpongeBob. I would say SpongeBob is like the least scariest show out there. It's freaking SpongeBob. <laughs> it's not even the gore that's unsettling. It's just the story. Okay, what's this? Sonic dot exe. Ooh, Sonic, huh? Ooh, this blood in his eyes. I honestly love the level of detail people used to put to their creepy pastas. Like you know, they drive the story, they like edit it, and then after that, they also edit like an image like j- j- that's just as creepy to go along with it. Like there was some dedication going on. Okay, so Sonic dot exe. I need more water. My mouth is dry. <laughs> oh god. Mm, okay. For you, gaming is about escape. When you push the button on the console, switching the PC on, you're switching the real world off and escaping to somewhere else for for a while. Recently, the bright primary colors and flat backgrounds of retro games have been your escape. Sure, the graphics are virtually primitive and the plinky plonk music can be infuriating, but there's something about the simplicity, the fullness of the characters and the amazing gameplay of those games that really appeals. Until that is, one of those games full of bright sunshine days suddenly turns dark. Until one of your favorite character fills the screen, but instead of offering his usual wide smile and mischievous eyes, he offers you emptiness, terror, and the dark, hollow void of empty sockets that leak some awful fluid. The music fades, the eyeless face glares at you, and you realize far too late you're in his world now. Okay. Let's see. <clears throat> I'm a total Sonic the Hedgehog fan, much like everyone else. I like the new- newer games, but I don't mind playing the classics. I don't think I've ever played a glitchy or hacked game before, so I don't think I want to play any after the experience I had. It started on a nice summer afternoon. I was playing Sonic Unleashed. I liked how you could explore the town in it, towns in it, until I noticed out of my peripheral vision that the main man had po- arrived and put something in my mailbox as usual and left. I paused my game to go see what I got in the mail. The only thing in the mail was mailbox was a CD case for computers and a note. I took it inside. I looked at the note and realized it was my dear friend Kyle. Let's just call him that, whom I hadn't heard from in two weeks. I know that because I recognized his handwriting. Though, what was weird is how it looked. It looked badly written and scratchy and somewhat difficult to read. As if Kyle was having a hard time writing it down, it didn't in a hurry. This is what he wrote. Tom, I can't take it anymore. I had to get rid of this thing somehow before it was too late, and I was hoping you'd do it for me. I can't do it. He's after me, and if you don't destroy the C- CD, he'll come after you too. He's too fast for me. Please, Tom, destroy this godforsaken disc before he comes after you too. It's too late for me. Destroy the disc, and you'll destroy him. But do it quick, otherwise he'll catch you. Don't even play the game. It's what he wants. Just destroy it, please, Kyle. Well, that was certainly weird. Even though Kyle is my best friend, I haven't seen him in two weeks. I didn't know what he, I didn't do what he asked me. I didn't think that just like a simple gaming disc would do anything bad to him. After all, it's just a game, right? <sighs> Boy, was I wrong about that. Anyway, I looked at the disc and it looked like any ordinary computer CD-R, except it had black marker on it written Sonic dot exe, and it was much like. Much unlike Kyle's handwriting, meaning he must have gotten it from someone else, like a pawn shop or eBay. When I saw Sonic on the writing of the CD, I was actually excited and wanted to play with it since I'm a big Sonic fan. 
I went up to my room and turned on my computer and put the disc in and installed the game. When the title screen popped up, I noticed that it was the first Sonic game. I was like, awesome, because I said, like I said earlier, I like the classics. The first thing I noticed w- was, the first thing that I w- that was out of place was when I pressed start. There was a this split second when I saw the little title image turn into something much different, something that I now consider horrifying before cutting to black. I remember what the image looked like in the split second of the game cut to black. The sky had darkened. The title emblem was rusted and ruined. The Sega 1991 was now Sega 666. And the water had turned red like blood, except it looked hyper-realistic. Of course, it's 666. You know, sometimes I wonder, does Satan have nothing better to do? Like, he's just sitting in hell and he's like, Hey, how about I take this childhood like this childhood favorite game and turn it into something demonic and then I give it to like a fan and freak the, f- the fuck out. Won't that be entertaining? <laughs> and you're just, you know, saying LOL out loud. <laughs> Not even laughing, just saying LOL out loud. <laughs> but the freakiest thing that was in the split second before the s- second frame was Sonic. His eyes were pitch black and bleeding with two glowing red dots staring right at me and his smile had stretched wider up to the edge of his face. I was rather disturbed about that image when I saw it, though I figured that it was just a glitch and forgot about it. After it cut to black, it stayed like that for about 10 seconds or so, and then another weird thing happened. The save file select from the Sonic the Hedgehog 3 popped up and I was like, what the fuck? Was this doing in the first Sonic game? Anyway, Anyway, then I noticed something off. The background was dark, cloudy sky of bad Stardust Speedway level from Sonic CD, and there was only three save files. The music was that from Creepy Caverns of Winter Music from Earthbound, only it was extended and seemed to have been in reverse. The image for the save file where you see preview of the level you're on is just red static for all three files. What freaked me out was the character selection. It only showed Tails, Knuckles, and to my surprise, Dr. Robotnik. Now I was sure something was up. I mean, how can you play Dr. Robotnik in a classic Sonic game for crying out loud? That's when I realized that this wasn't just a glitchy game, it was a hacked game. Yeah, it definitely looked hacked, it looked creepy, but as a smart gamer, I wasn't scared. I told myself that it was just a hacked game and there was nothing wrong with it. Anyways, shaking off the creeped out feeling, I picked the file 1 and chose Tails and when I selected and got started. The game froze for about 5 seconds, and then I heard a creepy pixelated laugh that sounded an awful lot like Kefka guy from Final Fantasy before cutting to black. The screen stayed black for about 10 seconds or more, then it showed the typical uh, uh, level title thing. Except the simplistic shapes were different shades of red and the text text showed only Hill Act 1. The screen faded in and and the level title vanished, revealing Tails in the Green Hill Zone from Sonic 1. The music was much different though, it sounded like it sounded like a peaceful melody in reverse. Anyway, I started playing and had Tails r- start running like you would in any of the classic Sonic games. What was odd was that Tails was running along the level, there was nothing but flat ground and a few trees for about 5 minutes. That was when the peaceful music started to lower down into a slow deep tones very slowly as I kept going. I suddenly saw something and I stopped to see what it was. It was one of the small animals lying dead on the ground, bleeding. Tails had a shocked and saddened look on his face, but I never saw him have that I never saw him have before. So I had him move along, and he kept that worried look on his face. As he kept moving, I saw more dead animals as Tails moved past them, looking more and more worried as the music lowers and he moves past more dead animals. I was shocked to sh- I was shocked to see they, how they were all dead. They looked like somebody killed them in rather gruesome ways. A squirrel was hanged on a tree with what appeared to have been his entrails hanging out. A bunny had all his limbs torn off and a duck had his eyes gouged out and his throat slit. I felt sick with my stomach when I saw the massacre and apparently so did the tails. After a few more seconds there were no more animals the music seemed to have stopped. I still kept tails to continue. After a minute passed the music stopped. Tails was running up a hill and then he stopped. It wasn't until I saw why. Sonic was there on the other sc- side of the screen with his back against Tails with his- and his eyes closed. Tails looked happy to see Sonic but then his smile faltered. Obviously not- noticing this guy, uh, Sonic wasn't responding to him. If not as I- acting as if 
what the hell is this writing oh my god it's so bad tears walked slowly towards sonic and i noticed that i wasn't even moving any uh, moving my keyboard to make him move so this had to be have been a cut scene suddenly i began to have a growing feeling of dread as tails walked closer to sonic to get his attention i felt that tails was in danger and something bad was going to happen i heard the faint static growing louder as tails was but inches away from sonic and stopped and stuck his hand out to touch him the foreboding feeling in my gut was growing strong- stronger and i felt the urge to tell tails to get away from sonic as the static grew louder Suddenly in a split second I saw Sonic's eyes open they were black with ro- with red glowing dots just like the title image though there wasn't a smile when when that happened on the sc- happened the screen turned black and the static sound was cut off it stayed black for about 7 seconds and then the white text appeared forming a message saying hello do you want to play with me at this point I was creeped out I didn't want to continue with the game but my curios- curiosity got the better of me when I was taken to a different level with the level title now saying hide and seek. This time I was in I was in the Angel Island level from Sonic 3 and it looked like it was on fire. Tails looked as though he was scared out of his wits this time. He actually looked at me and made frantic gestures to me as he wanted to get out of the area he was in as fast as possible. I was starting to get freaked out by this. I mean, Tails was actually breaking the fourth wall, trying to tell me to get him out of there. So I pressed down on the arrow key as hard as I could and made him run as fast as he could. A pixelated version of that creepy theme when you meet Shadow at the Ark as Robotkin from SA2 was playing as I made my as I made Tails trek through the desolate forest, trying to help him escape from whatever he was trying to run from. Suddenly, I heard that creepy laugh again. Right after 10 seconds have passed as I helped Tails run through the forest and then I started seeing flashes of Sonic popping everyone on this everywhere on the screen again with those black and red eyes. The music changed to that suspenseful drowning jingle as I see Sonic behind Tails slowly gaining up on him flying. Sonic wasn't running, he was actually flying. The flying sp- pose his sprite was making looked very similar to Metal Sonic's Okay, are you going to keep on referring to other games that I don't know about? <laughs> <laughs> you're not creeping me out you're just confusing me now <laughs> oh god this the flying pose his sprite was making looked very similar to the metal sonic's flying pose in sonic cd except it was just sonic and he had the black and red eyes again only this time He had the most deranged looking grin on his face. He looked as though he was enjoying the torment he was giving the poor little fox as he gained up on him. Suddenly, when Tails stripped, another cut scene, the music stopped and Sonic vanished. Tails laid there and started crying for 15 seconds. The scene was rather upsetting to watch and I kind of teared up myself. But then Sonic appeared in front of Tails and Tails looked up in horror. Blood started to come down in those blackened eyes of Sonic as a grin slowly grew from his face and he looked down at the horrified fox. I could do nothing but watch. Just in a split second, Sonic lunged at Tails right before the screen went black. There was a loud screeching noise that lasted for four, five seconds. The text returned only this time. It said, "You're too slow. Want to try again?" And then that god awful laugh came with it. I was so shocked by what happened. Did Sonic murder Tails? No, he couldn't have. He and Tails were supposed to be best friends. Why did Sonic do that to him? I shook the shock off as I was brought back to the character select character selection. The save file that had Tails was different. Tails was no longer in the box itself but in the TV screen which was flickering with the red static. Tails's expression scared me. His eyes were black and bleeding. His orange fur had gone black and he had an expression of anguish on his face. Trying to ignore it, I picked Knuckles next. The laugh came again and the screen cut to black and stayed there for t- another 10 seconds. This time the level said You can't run. I was really freaked out by now. I couldn't really tell if this was a glitch or a hack or some kind of sick twisted joke or anything really. But despite my fear of what happened next, I kept playing. The next level looked much different. I had the ground of the scraped drain zone, but the sky background looked like the me- main menu. It had a dark reddish cloudy sky. But it was the music that creeped me out the most. It sounded like g- the Gigi's theme right after the Okay, I have no idea what's happening and this is confusing the fuck out of me. I am moving on to another story. Oh my god, it's so long. 
Yeah, okay. I got it. Oh god, that is so long. Sorry, I know, I mean, it was something. I didn't find it interesting though. Not gonna lie, that story was unbearably dull. I didn't understand what was happening half the time. I'm not a Sonic like fan. <laughs> I was just like, what is going on? <laughs> so yeah, we're gonna move to the Russian sleep experiment. Okay. What is what where is my story? Oh my god, creepypasta, what the hell happened to you? Just full of weird ads. Okay. Russian sleep experiment. <clears throat> Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their ox oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them, since it was toxic in high concentrations. This was before the closed circuit cameras, so they only had microphones and five inch thick glass porthole-sized windows into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, cots to sleep, but no bedding, running water and toilet and it had enough dried food to last the fight for over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained, having been promised falsely that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. The conversations and activities were monitored and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidents in their past. In their past, and the general tone of the conversation took a darker aspect after the fourth day mark. After five days, they started complaining about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other and began alternately whispering to the microphones and the one-way mirrored port, uh, portholes. Oddly, they all seemed to think they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades, the other subjects in captivity with them. At first, the researchers suspected this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the ch entire chamber, repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about his behavior is how the other captives reacted to this, or rather, didn't react at all. They continued whispering to the microphones until the second of the captives started screaming. The two non-screaming captives took the books apart and speared page after pe page with their own feces and pasted them calmly over the glass portholes. The screaming promptly stopped. So did the whispering in the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers checked the microphones early to make sure they were working, since they thought it would be impossible that no one could be coming with five no sound could be coming with five people inside. The oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that five people must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the fourteenth day, the researchers did something they said that they would not do to get a reaction from their captives. They used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives they were afraid were either dead or vegetables. They announced, We are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one, or one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single frame in a calm voice. We no longer want to be afraid. Debate broke out among the researchers and the military forces funding the research. Unable to provoke any more responses using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed of the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air. Immediately, voices from the microphone began to object. Three different voices began bellowing, as if pleading for their, the lives of their loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was open and soldiers sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever and so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five subjects were still alive, although no one could rightly call the state that any of them were in alive. 
The food ration the past five days had not so much as touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead subject's thighs and chest stuffed into the drain in the center of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the water on the floor was actually blood was never determined. All four surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth as the researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most, of, most if not all of them were self-inflicted. The abdominal organs below the ribcage of all four test subjects had been removed. While the heart and lungs and diaphragm remained in one place, the skin and most of the muscles attached to the ribs were ripped off, exposing the lungs through the ribcage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had just taken out and laid, they were just, oh my god. They had just been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that they were digesting was their own flesh that they had ripped off and eaten over the course of days. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operators of the facilities, but they still refused to return to the chamber to remove the test subjects. They continued to be they continued to scream to be left in the chamber and alternately begged and demanded that the guards be turned on, lest they fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put on a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out. Another one was gravely injured by having his testicle ripped off and an artery in his leg severed by one of the subjects' teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives if you count ones that committed suicide in the following weeks. In the struggle, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than 10 times the human dose of morphine derivative and still fought like a cornered animal, breaking ribs and arm, breaking the ribs and arm of one doctor. When the heart was seen to beat for full two, two minutes after he had bled out to the point where, the, where, where there was more air in his vascular system than blood, even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for about three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in, in reach and just repeating the word, more, over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility. The two with intact vocal cords continued begging for the gas demanding to be kept alive. Eek. Hi hi, welcome to the stream. Just so you know, we're reading horror stories from like, you know, classic creepy pastas. These things tend to get graphic. Oh my god. Okay. Let's see. <clears throat> oh, you like horror stories? That's good. That's good. You'll fit right in. <laughs> we love horror stories here. Uh, we are right now reading the Russian sleep experiment. I'm kind of halfway through it though. So, uh, how do I give a br brief background of this? Basically, the, the Russians tried to do a sleep experiment where they tried to keep five people awake for 30 days with a stimulant and things went sideways, as you would expect. <laughs> Anyways, continuing on. <laughs> The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room that the facility had. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back within his body, it was found that he was effectively immune to the sedative they had given him to prepare him for the surgery. He fought furiously against his restraint when the anesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a 4 inch wide leather strap on one wrist, even the weight of a 200 pound soldier was holding that wrist as well. I don't understand this though. Okay, listen. I have spent one too many, you know, sleepless nights thanks to assignments and stuff in college. And when I was tired, I could barely lift a cup of coffee. <laughs> These men over here are tearing through people and flesh like like it's paper. Like what kind of super strength do you have? <laughs> It took only a little more anesthetic than normal to put him under, and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that died on the operating, ta operating table, it was found that his blood had tripled the normal level of oxygen. 
His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn and he had broken nine bones in his struggle to not be subdued. Most of them were from his from the force of his own muscles. The second survivor had been the first of the group of the five to start screaming. His vocal cords had been destroyed. He was unable to beg or object to sur- surgery and he only re- reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproving in, in disapproval when the anesthetic gas was brought near him. He shook his head yes when someone suggested re- reluctantly they tried the surgery without anesthetic and did not react to the entire 6 up procedure of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin the surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it should be medically possible for the patient to still be alive one terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a mu- smile several times when her eyes met his oh i would quit right there When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of a drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so the patient could write his message. It was simple: keep cutting. <laughs> oh my god, no. <laughs> How about you know How about we don't keep cutting and just end this here? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm not going to end this here. <laughs> oh my god. The other two test subjects were given the same surgery, both without anesthetic as well, although they had been injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation. The surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralyzed the subjects could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short period of time and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves, why they had ripped out their own guts and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one response was given. I must remain awake. All three subjects restraints were reinforced and they were placed back into the chamber awaiting determination as to what should be done with them. The researchers facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of their project considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer, a former KGB agent, instead saw potential and wanted to see what could happen if they were put back on gas. The researcher strongly strongly objected and were overruled. Bro, I would literally quit at this point. I would be like, "Okay, you want to put them back on the gas? You do that. I'm a leave. <laughs> Goodbye." In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going back on the gas. It was obvious that at this point all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all his might. First left, then right, then left again for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly. Having been the first to be wired for EEG, most of the researchers were monitoring his brain waves in surprise. They were normal most of the time, but sometimes flatlined inexplicably. It looked as if he were repeatedly suffering from brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on the paper scrolling out of the brain wave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the moment his head hit the pillow. His brain wave immediately changed to that of deep sleep, then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brain wave showed the same flatlines as the one who had just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as three researchers. Oh my god. One of the named 3 immediately grew, drew his gun and shot the commander point blank between his eyes, then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew out his brains. He pointed his gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to a bed, as the remaining members of the medical and research team fled the room. "I won't be locked in here with these things, not with you." he screamed at the man strapped to the table. "What are you?" he demanded. "I must know." The subject smiled. "Have you forgotten so easily? We are you." We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at the very moment, at, at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide in your heads every night. 
we are what you sedate into silent and paralyze and silence and para- paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread the researcher paused then aimed the subjects aimed at the subject's heart and fired the eeg flatlined as the subject weakly choked out so nearly free Yeesh. oh that was the end oh god my god that was creepy that one was creepy you know what better th- definitely better than the sonic one But the ending was very like eh, like oh yeah we are the madness in your mind yeah, let's let's call let's just say, you know be honest here you're literally just sleep deprived you've gone crazy from sleep deprivation <laughs> you're not the madness in my mind i assure you but the only the only bad things that my mind thinks of doing is ah oh, what if we sl- slip out at 4 in the night and you know eat the last chocolate in the fridge <laughs> i don't know about primal urges my guy <laughs> i only know about eating chocolate <laughs> uh so that was russian sleep experiment <laughs> yep hey yeah, this kind of reminds me of that movie uh what was that movie that we watched um come true i think it's called yeah come true where they have that experiment where these people have to sleep like that's basically all they have to do they have to sleep and the scientists will, scientists will be monitoring them and seeing exactly what's going on in their minds that was kind of like the same thing right it was like a experiment on sleeping though the movie was kind of all over the place but it had a very interesting like concept it kind of reminds me of that okay so i'm going to take a break here because i've been talking for a while and so i've been drinking water and i have to pee <laughs> 5 minutes break guys and then we come back to more creepy stories.
Whew, okay, I'm back. I have to say, being after like reading a creepy ass horror story is an adventure. I managed to freak myself out by simply opening the door. How? When I open the door, I step out, right? I step outside and uh, there's a creaking sound and I was like, what the fuck? Where did that come from? Because everyone else in my house is sleeping right now. And then I realized that creep creaking sound came from my freaking door because I opened it. <laughs> Oh my god. I gave myself a heart attack by opening my door. <laughs> Horror story streamer is afraid of ghosts. <laughs> yes, I am afraid of ghosts. If something appeared in front of me, I would die. Not simply just die. I would not even fight it. I would not even go to an exorcist. I would just be like, "Goodbye world. <laughs> my time has come. <laughs> I leave now." <laughs> Oh, hold on, where's my music? Ah, oh, there she is. Oh, okay. There's also like this thing, right? So where I live, there's like a lot of construction work happening. There's always construction work happening here. Someone or the other is always like renovating their house. Like how many times can you renovate a house, man? Please, chill. Anyways, they're always doing that. So today the renovation work went on longer than usual so there was like drilling sounds and all that bullshit happening for like for a very long time so these people are just leaving now and it's like the middle of the night and so they're just leaving now so it's like i so after the creaking sound i get freaked out and i go to the bathroom and then again there's more sounds and i'm like what the fuck is happening is there a ghost if there is one can you just like let, let me know so i'm not paranoid all the time but <laughs> it's just trucks leaving oh, okay what's this mm. jeff the killer not gonna lie when i was a kid i wasn't very scared of jeff the killer and this is coming from someone who gets freaked out by everything like light switches off on its own I cry. <laughs> But yeah, there's just something Jeff the Killer has just never been that scary. Yeah, the image is freaky, but like mm, I don't know. Anyways, Jeff the Killer. <clears throat> you wake at 3 a.m. disturbed by some subtle shifting sound within the room, just on the edge of hearing. Propping up on one arm, you survey the room looking for the source of the noise, hoping beyond hope that you won't find one. At first, your hopes are raised. Everything seems to be silent. Everything seems to be still. But it isn't. From behind the long concealing drape of the, the curtain, a voice with flickering serpentine hiss whispers. Go to sleep. Suddenly, you know what's about to happen and exactly who is waiting to meet you. What have they done to the creepy pasta side? Honestly, so before it was just you know used to be on creepy pasta. There used to be like you had the story, and that was it. But now you have an introduction to the story. Then you have an overview. Then you have a whole section describing how the story came to be, how this creature was came into being, and then you have an, a story. Why they do that? Creepy pasta used to used you used to be so cool. <laughs> Okay, let's see. The story of Jeff the Killer. <clears throat> a 13 years old Jeff, Jeffrey Allen Woods or Jeff C. Hodick, depending upon who you ask, but more on that later. Moved with his parents and brother Leo to a new town. Here, Jeff and his siblings encountered three bullies and are threatened with knives. Okay. Jeff beats these bullies badly with Lou taking the blame for the assault and being carted off by the ever reliable police. Guilt-ridden and depressed at having let Lou take the blame for his actions, Jeff's days get even worse when he meets the bullies again and is horribly burnt in an attack with alcohol and be- bleach. The burning results in Jeff being permanently disfigured. His skin bleached white, physically whilst his mind snaps. Upon being discharged for discharged for some reason, 
His doctor is apparently attributing Jeff's insane behavior to the painkillers he has taken. Jeff arrives home and proceeds to make a bad situation worse by purposely mutilating his already discovered disfigured face, cutting a permanent smile into his mouth and cheeks and burning off his eyelids so that they can so that he can only see his face. Jeff then goes on to kill his kill both his parents and his brother Lou, meeting him with the instruction go to sleep before stabbing him and disappearing on a wider and less discriminating killing spree, which it would seem continues to this day. Okay, is that a story? Is this it? Ah, this is a story. Excerpt from a local newspaper. Ominous unknown killer is still at large. After weeks of unexplained murders, the ominous unknown killer is still on the rise. After little, little evidence has been found, a young boy states that he survived one of the killer's attack and bravely tells his story. I had a bad dream and I woke up in the middle of the night, says the boy. I saw that for some reason the window was open, even though I remember it being closed before I went to bed. I got up and shut it once more. Afterwards, I simply cl- crawled under my covers and tried to go back to sleep. That's when I had a strange feeling, like someone was watching me. I looked up and nearly jumped out of the bed. There, in the little ray of light illuminating from between my curtains, were a pair of two eyes. They weren't regular eyes. They were dark, ominous eyes. They were bordered in black and just plain out terrified me. That's when I saw his mouth. A long, horrendous smile that made every hair on my body stand up. The figure stood there watching me. Finally, after what seemed like forever, he said it. A simple simple phrase, but said in a way only a madman could speak. He said, Go to sleep. I let out a scream. That's what sent him at me. He pulled up a knife aiming at my heart. He jumped on top of my bed. I fought him back. I kicked, I punched, I rolled around, trying to knock him off me. That's when my dad busted in. The man threw the knife. It went into my dad's shoulder. The man probably would have finished him off if the, one of the neighbors hadn't alerted the police. They drove into the parking lot and ran towards the man. The man turned and ran down the hallway. I heard a smash, like glass breaking. As I came out of my, came out of my room, I saw the window that was pointing towards the back of my house was broken. I looked out to see him vanish into the distance. I can tell you one thing. I will never forget his face. Those cold, evil eyes and that psychotic smile. They will never leave my head. Police are still on the look for this man. If you see anyone that fits the description in his story, please contact your local police department. Jeff and his ma- Okay, bye-bye. Have a good dinner. It's nice meeting you too. See you around, hopefully. Bye. Hmm. Okay, where are we? Eight. Huh. Jeff and his family had just moved into a new neighborhood. His dad had gotten a promotion at work, and they thought it would be best to live in one of the fancy neighborhoods. Jeff and his brother Lou, Liu couldn't complain though. A new, better house it was not love. As we were getting unpacked, one of the neighbors came by. Hello, she said. I'm Barbara. I live across from the street from you. Well, I just wanted to introduce myself and my son, Bill. Billy said hi and ran back to the play uh, to play in his yard. Well, said Jeff's mom, I'm Margaret and this is my husband, Peter, and my two sons, Jeff and Liu. They each introduced themselves and then Barbara invited them to her son's birthday. Jeff and his brother were about to object when their mother said they would love to. When Jeff and his family were done packing, Jeff went up to his mom. Mom, why would you invite us to some dumb kid's ba- party? If you haven't noticed, I am not a dumb kid. Jeff said his mother, "We just moved here. We should show what we we should show that we want to spend time with our neighbors. Now we're going to that party, and that's final." Jeff started to walk, but stopped himself. Started talk, but stopped himself, knowing that he couldn't do anything. Whenever his mother said something, it was final. He walked up to his room and plopped down on his bed. He sat there, looking at his ceiling, when suddenly, he caught a weird feeling. Not so much pain, but a weird feeling. He dismissed, his, dismissed it as just some random feeling. He heard his mother call, and he walked down to, called down to get, uh, get his stuff, and he walked away. The next day, Jeff walked downstairs to get breakfast and got ready for school. As he sat there eating his breakfast, he once again had that feeling. This time it was stronger. It gave him a slight tugging pain, but he once again dismissed it. As he and Liu finished breakfast, they walked down to the bus stop. They sat there waiting for the bus, then all of a sudden, 
Some kid on a skateboard jumped over them, only inches above their laps. They both jumped back in surprise. Hey, what the hell? The kid landed and turned back to them. He kicked his skateboard up and caught it with his hands. The kid seems to be about 12, one year younger than Jeff. He wears an Arup- Aeropost tail shirt and ripped blue jeans. Well, 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 it looks like we got some new meat. Suddenly two other kids appear. One was super skinny and the other was huge. Well, since you're new here, I'd like to introduce myself. Oh, I'd like to introduce ourselves. Oh, there is Keith. Jeff and Leo look over to the skinny kid. He had a dopey face that you would accept a, expect a sidekick to have. And he's Troy. They looked over at the fat kid. Talk about tub of law. Oh my god, that's offensive. And I, the first kid said, I'm Randy. Now for all the kids in this neighborhood, there is a small prize for bus fare if you catch my drift. Leo stood up, ready to punch the lights out of the kid's eyes when one of his friends pulled up a knife. I hoped you would be more cooperative, but it seems we must do this the hard way. The kid walked up to Lou and took his wallet out of his pocket. Jeff got, the fe- got that feeling again now. It was truly strong, a burning sensation. He stood up, but Lou gestured for him to sit down. Jeff ignored him and walked up to the kid. Listen here, you little punk. Give back my bro's wallet or else. Randy put the wallet in his pocket and pulled out his knife. Oh, and what, would you, what will you do? Just as he finished the sentence, Jeff popped the kid's nose. As Randy screeched for his face, Jeff grabbed the kid's wrist and broke it. Randy screamed and Jeff grabbed the knife from him. Troy and Keith rushed Jeff, but Jeff was too quick. He threw Randy he threw Randy to the ground. Keith lashed out at him and Jeff ducked and stabbed him in the arm. Is this supposed to be horror? Why am I reading so much action? What? Why? No. Okay, never mind. We're skipping this. See, I told you, Jeff the Killer just does not freak me out. <laughs> Jeff the Killer versus Slenderman. Uh, no thanks. Ben Round. What is this? Ew. Link, is that you? Yeah, it's just like there's just like two more paragraphs of Jen, uh, Jeff just fighting off bullies. Like, oh yeah, let's go. You know, it's the superhero in the making. But guess what? You're in a creepy pasta. <laughs> okay. I wanna like read one final story because we've been doing this for a while. But uh, I can't decide what I wanna read. You know what? I'm gonna read. I shall read my story. <laughs> Lol the killer, but he targets assholes, but I'm not gonna complain. <laughs> he only goes after bullies. <laughs> How am I supposed to hate him? Okay, so I had written this story for, you know, the R No Sleep Reddit, the subreddit, whatever it's called. So I did it for that. It only has two parts, unfortunately, because I got so busy with life. Then after that, it was like, uh, I don't think I could continue it on R No Sleep because they have very strict rules. Because basically the story needs to be like, it needs to seem like something that's actually happened. So it's always from first person point of view. And because you also have to take into account real life happenings, otherwise, because you know, then it wouldn't seem real, so it just doesn't work. Maybe I'll post it somewhere else someday if you guys like it. Let me just take this. I'm just gonna go through like the first part, and then we'll see. <laughs> okay, my dorm dorm has rules that no one told me about. Rules that could possibly end a life. Moving to a new country is always terrifying. There are so many things that you have to look into, from visa pro- approvals to places to stay, payments and budgeting, it's acting, it's tiring, and it's a good way to make someone's anxiety worse. When I got my offer letter from university in Singapore, I was thrilled. 
and accepted the offered letter, I felt guilty. My family isn't all that rich, and I knew that supporting my education wouldn't be an easy task, especially since Singapore is an expensive place to stay. But I had, but I had always wanted to study more, to expand my horizons, and experience new things. I couldn't do any of this if I stayed home, and my parents understood that. After applying for scholarships to cover at least part of my tuition, I was packed and ready to go. The biggest problem I faced was finding a place to stay. Since my classes were in the evening, I would only finish by 11 p.m. I needed a place not too far from college. While Singapore is a safe, safe space for girls, my mother didn't want me to take any chances. Then there was my budget. I couldn't afford to stay in an expensive place, and unfortunately, my college dorm was full. I would have to find boarding elsewhere. I was searching only for rooms, apart, apartments, honestly, any place where I could stay when I came across a website for a dorm for international students. I scrolled through the different rooms and prices they offer. It was like God had heard my cries. Play, this place was a blessing because not only was it cheap, but it was two subway stops from my college. And if I were to share a room with other people, I would actually be saving money. Though I would have to use a communal washroom, but I was prepared for that. I clicked on the check availability button and there was only one triple sharing room vacant. At that time, I thought it was meant to be. A thing I feared when I arrived at the dorm was that it would be nothing like the photos on the website. But, I stepped in, but as I stepped into my new room, my fear simply vanished. It was big and spacious with three beds in each corner. There were three big desks, chairs and a closet that came with lockers. All in all, it was a good place and I felt like I could stay there for eternity. I was so overjoyed that I found that I had found this place that I barely noticed that there was absolutely no one in the halls. Apart from the people who took care of the place, for a three-story building, I hadn't seen one student around. There was an eerie silence that blanketed the dorms, one that I didn't notice on my first day. My mind was full of so many thoughts, so many things that I still needed to do that I missed all the warning signs. When I first came to Singapore, I made a resolve that I would get my life on track. This meant sleeping early so that I could wake up early. I'm a night owl by nature, so my sleep cycle was a mess. One that I, intend that I intended on fixing. During my first week here, I didn't notice anything strange, but that was mostly because I barely stayed in my room. Though I did realize that my roommates were never really around. They left in the morning and returned in the night. Either they were in the room before 12, or they didn't come back at all. And they weren't really, they weren't real talkers. After coming back to, coming, uh, to the room, they would just change in a hurry and be in bed as soon as possible. I didn't pay much attention to the jittery actions the terrified ex expressions on their face when they came back to the room at 11.50 p.m. I wish I did pay attention to them. I wish I paid attention to other things that happened around me as well. I was so busy exploring Singapore, making friends and hanging out with them that I didn't realize that no one used the kitchen after 8 o'clock. I didn't notice that the fridge had a lock and could, o could not be opened after 11.30 p.m. And because I was trying so hard to sleep early, I didn't realize that no one stepped out of their rooms after 12 a.m. So sometimes, when I woke up in the middle of the night, I could hear people shuffling outside, the lift doors open and opening and closing over and over again. Ding, ding, ding. They say old habits are hard to break. For a while, I tried my best to fix my sleep cycle, but as classes got hectic, I could feel myself falling back into my usual pattern. When I continued to work on my assignments as my roommates turned in for the night, sometimes I find them staring at me confused. They seem scared for me. And that reaction always seems excessive. I didn't even know why they were so worried about me. It's not like they even knew my name. We had never spoken before this after all. One night, I was actually watching a movie instead of working. My rule of going early to be going to bed early had been tossed in the bin. I had evening classes anyway, so it didn't matter if I slept through the morning. It was around 3 a.m. and I got out of bed to use the washroom after having one too many sips of Pepsi. The moment I opened the door, I heard the ding of the elevator. When I turned to look at it, I hoped to see another resident of the dorm, someone I could strike up a conversation with, but there was no one there. The doors of the elevator opened, and the light inside was bright and inviting. The longer the door stayed open, the more I stared. The more I stared, the more I wanted to step inside. And as I waited, not a single soul came by. The door closed the ding and the strange trance I was in was finally broken. Damn, I must really be tired, I thought. 
As I continued the journey to the washroom, which wasn't really long since my room was two doors away, I felt eyes on me, watching my every move, watching the way my knees bent every time with every step I took, watching as goosebumps came to life across my skin, tiny hair standing up in attention, watching as I crossed my arms and hunched down as if that would hide me from the invisible stare. I told myself over and over that I was imagining things. The stress was from college was aggravating my anxiety. That had to be it. But when I reached the washroom, my hand reaching to open the door, I heard the sound of someone sobbing. I don't know why I felt the need to turn. I don't know, I don't know why I just had to know who was crying. On any other day, I wouldn't. I would just mind my own business. But today, I looked towards the sound and found the, that the door to one of the rooms was ajar. Inside on the bed, I could see a boy sitting on the edge and crying, face covered with his hands. He cried and cried, body shaking with every tear he took. But the sound of it was so hollow. It was not it was as if he wasn't really sad. Crying was just another process, a task that he had to complete. Chewing on my lower lip, I was about to turn away when he looked up, making my heart leap into my mouth. His face was normal, so very normal, fair skin dark hair and dark eyes, a sharp nose with a square jaw. Nothing about him was striking, yet when I saw him, I couldn't look away. Despite how generic he looked, the tears that streaked leaked from his eyes were red, deep like crimson blood. And as his gaze settled on me, in seconds he was on his feet, marching to the door. My thought was that he was angry that I was invading his privacy. But then, his hand reached out, grabbing my wrist instead of the door. Confusion and fear swept over me as I was pulled forward away from the washroom and into his room. My lips parted to scream, body already twisting and turning, trying to fight out of his grasp. It was then I, it was then that I saw it. A sight so terrifying that it made my blood run cold. The door to the washroom had been previous that had been previously locked was now wide open. Darkness pulling from its depths, tendrils stretching out and then pulling back in, pulsating. And in the heart of it all, with a pair of red blood, was a pair of eyes, blood red, fixed on me. Their gaze was familiar, as if they had been watching me from the moment I stepped out of my room, as if they had been with me since the day I moved into the dorms. As I pulled into the room, the darkness stared at me, and the creature that lurked in its depths smiled, its white teeth sharp and jagged, piercing through the black. Then. The boy slammed the door shut. My thoughts ran wild, a storm of emotions building up inside of me. I couldn't make sense of what I had seen. I couldn't make sense of the situation I was in. My heart continued to hammer in my chest because this was far from over. After all, just because I had escaped one danger didn't mean I hadn't stepped into another, something more sinister. When I turned around to face the boy, waiting to see a mon monstrosity in his place, Nothing about him had changed, only his eyes weren't leaking red, leaking red anymore. Still holding onto my hand, anger marring his face, he shook me and asked, Don't you know it's dangerous to leave your room at night? And... The end. <laughs> this is the second part, but you know what, I'll get to that in the, other, uh, in the next stream. But yeah. <laughs> That's the end of my dorm has rules that no one told me about. What are the rules? Who knows? <laughs> well, I do, but <laughs> you'll just have to come here next time to find out. Oh my god. <sighs> I don't know, I, I mean, I enjoyed writing the story, but like, I'm not sure if people would like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I've never really like I didn't really share it with a lot of people when I first like posted it. Then I'm with that with most of my writing. I kind of like usually just like keep it to myself. Like, hush hush. Okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hey, <laughs> switch to another screen. <laughs> it's the same thing, just with ending soon on it. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's gonna be it for today's stream. I had a lot of fun reading all these horror stories. 
I feel like I want to do something like this again. Ah, oh, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah i think i want to do more streams like this i mean i know horror streams and like story reading is everyone's cup of tea because it's just like you're just staring at a screen listening to a person talk but like uh, i like horror stories and like going through all these creepy pastas was like such a great like trip down memory lane and usually trips down memory lanes end with a lot of cringing and going like oh my god why was i like this <sighs> I have to say though the things that creeped you out as a child is so funny to look at them again as an adult because your reaction to them is so different like you know basically me with slender man or jab the killer get an again again but yeah if you guys like the stream i will try and do more of these and uh, More, more like these when I'm not sure when like I have to decide though because I do want to play games as well I don't want to like completely give on give up on that and just become like a horror story streamer <laughs> but yeah so I'll just have to like sh- sort out my schedule and see exactly because see exactly when I can do this this fun though I think I don't know man there are some stories that just you know you can tell which stories were written by adults and like which weren't because like if you look at Squidward's suicide it was written by someone who knew what the fuck they were talking about like all the description about sound and equipment and frames you knew they you can tell that this person knows exactly what they're talking about because they are in the industry or they they did they've done their research then you look at stories like sonic and you're like oh my god <laughs> the sonic story was just like yeah dropping names like this game that game that music this that and i'm like what the fuck are you talking about <laughs> spare me <laughs> i'm going to like try and look up like the pokemon ones as well i know there are a lot of pokemon creepy pastas and this is like there was another one that i really liked as a child which was like abandoned by disney so like two or three that came under that so like you know what i'm going to look up all of these things so the next like, we can we can maybe three maybe make this like a once a week sort of a thing like, depending on like you know depending like we can do this once a week or something like play games and once a week we can sit here with our torches in our hand a cup of like anything to keep you warm and any soft type soft toy to cuddle as we go through different horror stories but yeah that is it for today thank you so much for joining us and thank you all the new folks who came by it's always nice to see new faces but yeah that is it for today's stream I'll see you guys next time. Again, uh before I go of course, we do have a Discord. If you go to my about page, you can find the link for it there. And if you join the Discord, what's hmm what's the benefit of joining the Discord? Well, <laughs> the benefit is that you'll know when the next horror stream is because I usually post like let people know there first that this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> Other than that, you can get a few cool roles, I guess. <laughs> but that's pretty much it. <laughs> but we love to see you there. But yeah, thanks again for you guys for watching and sticking with me as I fumbled my way through stories. <laughs> I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye.